Good morning, everybody. It's Leon Ayer here from the British Chamber of Business here in Southern Africa, and great to connect with you for this morning's webinar. We're delighted to be supported and sponsored by the Johannesburg Stock Exchange today and a distinguished panel of guests. They're going to discuss the merits of accessing the South African capital markets. So we're going to jump straight into a quite, a, quite a cool format we've got for you this morning, whereby we're going to play some videos, we're going to have a moderated discussion and, some, and a presentation, followed by the opportunity for you to uh, engage in some Q&A. So I please encourage you to use the Q&A function on, on, the, on, the, on your screen so we can feed those questions in at the end. And please do enjoy our, our panel discussion. So before we start with that, we're going to play a quick video that introduces the inward listings within the Joe Berg Stock Exchange. I'm going to cue my colleague Gima to place that video now. Let me start with a big thank you to Nick Nielsen King uh, and her team at the JSC for the warm welcome this morning and for the tremendous support they have given us during the fast track listing process, 21 days. That's an amazing world record for sure. It's great to be listed in our own right on the Johannesburg Stock Exchange and it's a historic moment in our, in our firm's history. You grow, you lead. JSE. Uh, Valdez actually got a Bachelor of Business Science in Actuarial Science and spent time at Merrill Lynch and Renaissance Capital before becoming head of equity, the equities and derivatives division within the stock exchange. And he's now director of capital markets. Good morning, Valdez. Good, good morning, uh, Leon. Thank you for having uh, me and welcome to our guests. Um, I'm just checking if my camera's on. Sorry about that. Um, sorry, two minutes. There we go. Good Perfect. morning, everybody. Uh, and thank you uh, for joining us this morning. It really is a privilege and an honor to have everyone join us. And thank you for your time. It's lovely to engage with you. As Leon mentioned, my name is Valdine Reddy, and I'm the Director of Capital Markets at the JSE. And uh, it really is an honor just to chat to you a little bit about our South African capital markets uh, before the team goes through some detailed uh, Q&A and panel discussion around the market structure and around the opportunities of accessing capital in South Africa. So as the JSC, we are 19th largest uh, exchange in the world by market cap, according to WFP exchanges, and have had a long history in uh, capital markets, uh, specifically the public capital markets. Uh, having been in existence for 134 years. The South African um, capital markets really started through the mining boom, and we still stay quite a flavor of a mining stance in our market, although have diversified quite significantly in the past 134 years through the cycles as well that we faced in global markets. Uh, and what has been quite great in our, in our uh, economy and in our country is that the financial markets are quite deep, robust, stand quite far differentiated from some of the other vulnerabilities or headwinds in the market. Uh, just to highlight, our market is quite deep and liquid. Uh, so from an institutional investor side, the market really grew up as a collective investment schemes market. And as such, we have um, a deep uh, uh, and liquid uh, institutional market that deploys assets in terms of the capital formation in South Africa. In fact, the assets of the non-banked are, are twice that of the bank. So you really have this 
a, a large assets under management coming from your institutional uh, network. South Africa has also stand quite um, uh, differentiated from emerging markets. And while it's very cyclical in nature as we've gone through different global uh, crises and situations, uh, South Africa proves to be pretty liquid. And uh, while South Africa has um, fared uh, very diverse in terms of the opportunities for investment, we've faced a number of headwinds over the years that we're now resurrecting from that uh, we bought quite well in, in terms of showcasing. So some of the challenges have been the relevance of South Africa in, uh, in global uh, emerging markets. And really what we've seen is as other markets have come up uh, to the fore, markets like Argentina, Saudi, or even China, uh, South Africa has waned a little bit in, uh, in waiting. That said, through hyper-volatile periods, South Africa has resumed the um, liquidity metrics and appeal factors that you would see in, uh, in, uh, in really deep markets. So through the 2020 pandemic and extended into the 2021 year, we've seen massive levels of elevation and growth in our markets um, coming to the fore. Uh, and we've really seen our values and volumes traded up uh, from our 2019 levels as we have a diverse mix of clients from both our offshore clients, um, a local South African institutional based clients, a small uptick in our retail client base, and then liquidity providers from global markets. From a listings perspective, we have north of 300 odd listings um, on our exchange, of which uh, more than uh, 25 to 30% of those are due listings. And what bodes quite well of South Africa, as has it been evidenced with our due listed counters, uh, we have quite diverse market uh, participants. Our issuers have grown. So while our a number of listings have shrank over the past decade, we've seen our market cap of our market soar and grow quite uh, strong, taking us to be 19th largest in the world. Uh, what we've also seen is that from the issuers listed on our market, as mentioned, we have a large portion of those as due listed counters. And within those dual listed counters, most of our corporates have grown to become uh, international companies uh, and, and really much tracking uh, some of the global indices and are included in some of the global indices, as well as having very diverse investor pools. Uh, so of our dual listed companies, a lot of our international companies, by nature of um, them being South African, uh, have diverse revenue streams where almost 70% of our top 40 companies have revenue streams from offshore uh, uh, assets or from offshore entities or operations, which makes South Africa quite good from a diversification perspective in terms of rand hedge companies, as well as through volatile um, currency cycles, you have lots of exposures and opportunities within de the defensive plays. What we've worked on over the past couple of years, and the team will work through in more detail, is um, a really um, competitive and internationally comparable listings framework universe. And in the opening um, video that we had, we had some of our global majors come and list at the JSE uh, really to tap into this deep, uh, deep investor base that we speak of, but also to uh, you know, have a really seamless and easy process to listing. So we have a 21 day fast track listings process. Uh, we've uh, got product development across the board. Uh, we've just recently added a standard listings framework. We have a, a secondary listings uh, a framework that has been well established. And all of these are efforts to attract due listing um, and secondary listings to our market. We have a number of inward listed counters, some of the global majors here listed on our exchange, uh, a lot in the um, uh, beverage space, in the uh, retail and property space, definitely from a mining perspective, as mentioned, that was the premise of how the South African market developed. Uh, so quite diverse companies listed a uh, uh, number of international um, renewables companies as well. So quite diverse companies inward listed here. And South Africa is hungry. Uh, our investor base is hungry for diversification and the opportunities that present. I'm going to hand over the team now to get into some of the meat of the detail. But again, I want to thank you for your time. Uh, we really look forward to uh, discussing and engaging with you. We wanted to showcase the JC team as well as part of our ecosystem. So we have um, guests on from Standard Bank and Investec. And I really want to make this an engaging session for you to find out more about uh, the South African capital markets and why it is really an appealing destination to access capital and to really uh, tap into deep liquidity for secondary market trade. Uh, so I'm going to hand back over to Leon now just uh, to take us through the rest of the program. 
And we look forward to your engagement questions and to really build this uh, relationship and journey with you. Thank you for your time. Thanks, thanks very much, Valdine, and some great uh, data there and stats about the kind of uh, history and legacy of the stock exchange and how rich it is right now. I think before we hand over to Samuel, who's going to lead our panel discussion, we're going to play another video, which is actually an interview from Andrew Coombs, who's the CEO of Sirius Real Estate. Cool. Sirius was, as Patricia has explained, the first company back in December 2014 to take advantage of the fast track listing process. And if I tell you that um, since 2012, Sirius had been coming to South Africa to recruit South African shareholders, but had been doing so as um, an A-listed stock on the London Stock Exchange. And throughout 2013, we were investigating how we could have dual listing, but we really couldn't see a clear and simple cost-effective way through the process. So when the fast track listing was introduced at the back end of 2014, we were delighted to all of a sudden be able to see a clear and cost-effective way through to um, ensuring Sirius was dual listed onto the South African Stock Exchange. And since then, Sirius has moved to the main markets in both Johannesburg and London. We are today a FTSE 250 organization um, with somewhere in the region of 2 billion euros of um, assets that we own and manage and a market capitalization of just over um, 1.1 billion euros. So we have grown with the help of South Africa um, investment quite considerably over the last six or seven years. But it was definitely the fast track listing process that was key. That together with a good sponsor, who in our case was PSG, and PSG Capital R to this day, um, our sponsor in South Africa. We were surprised at how relatively inexpensive the process was in comparison to um, listing um, on the London um, alternative and, and main markets. And what I would say is we were also pleasantly comforted by the, um, the, the process that we went through. So we were asked to submit a business plan which was reviewed by the JSE we had to present to a JSC panel. We found that whilst it was a fast track process, it was a very thorough process. And whilst obviously there were advantages in the process because we were already listed on the London Stock Exchange, nonetheless, the JSC was very thorough um, in making sure that, you know, um, Sirius was a company with a good plan and with the right levels of governance that would be required um, for a dual um, listing. Now, what we found in terms of um, having the advantage of those two capital markets is that in London, a lot of our investors are predominantly interested in our net asset value and our total return. Whereas in South Africa, People, um, as previously explained, are offering, offer, often investing in a euro-denominated stock such as Sirius in order to hedge against the RAND. And in South Africa, people are predominantly interested, in our experience, in the dividend that we pay, our income distribution. And this puts us in quite an interesting position because when we talk to London markets, we're talking about now the total return. And when we talk to um, our investors in South Africa, we find ourselves playing to the round hedge and the strength of our model in terms of um, distributing um, income. Sirius has progressively increased its dividend um, since December 2014. And our business model is such that that dividend is one and a half times covered by earnings. So it's a very strong and reliable dividend. But what we found is 
that whereas when we were single listed stock, we were really just playing to NAV and total return. Now across two capital markets, we have a far more four dimensional approach. In as much as we can talk to people about the advantages of Sirius from a round hedge perspective, from a dividend perspective, from a total return perspective, and from an NAV perspective. And what that means is that we have a broader set of advantages that we can market across two capital markets to our, our existing and potential um, investors. It, it means that our opportunity to appeal to the investor base across two capital markets is much, much greater than it was in the days when we were simply talking about NAV and total return to people in London. What we also found was coming to South Africa, there are a number of what I would refer to as boutique investment houses, people like Blue Spray spring to mind. And originally we saw those as single investors. But when we raised capital in December 2014 and on the occasions um, that we've raised capital since, what we find when we actually print the shares is there is a long tail of retail investors that sit within those boutique houses. So whereas we found it and still do find it difficult in London to access retail investors, what we were pleasantly surprised about in South Africa is the extent to which we were able to access a retail following. And we feel that that really benefited us in terms of the progression of our, uh, of our share, because prior to the dual listing, we had been quite weak in terms of any retail um, interest within the, within the share itself. Our, our shares are fully fungible across the two exchanges. And what we have also found is that on many occasions, the share price has been made in South Africa. And when that share price has been led by South African investors, we've been very impressed with the appetite of South Africans to manage the arbitrage, to effectively go to London, buy the share at a lower price, because it's fully fungible, move it back to South Africa and benefit from the arbitrage between the two. This has helped liquidity, it has you know, helped us to be able to um, even out the share price across the two markets. And it's been a distinct advantage of not just the dual listing, but the fully fungible nature of the shares across the two exchanges. And over the last um, three years, Sirius has been um, part of the SAPI index, which has helped our liquidity. Um, and um, whilst we have um, needed to move to um, a primary dual listing in South Africa to get inclusion in that index, we have um, found that there have been a lot of advantages, um, most notably in terms of the liquidity of getting into um, that particular index. So overall, we've been very, very pleased with um, the experience in South Africa. We listed at, um, I think, four and a half um, rand back in 2014. Um, we're now just under 20 rand. In that time, the size of the company has grown quite considerably. We have been able to recruit um, a number of high profile institutions um, from South Africa. And Sirius is extremely proud and pleased of its joint heritage across both the South African and London exchange. And certainly it is something that I would recommend to you know, any CEO who's interested in growing quickly um, and who wants to take advantage of, of more than one capital market. Thank you. That's yeah, some interesting insights there and a success story from a British company that enjoyed the benefits and you could see there the returns that the JSC delivered. I'm now gonna hand over to Samuel Mokorosi, who's head of deals and origination of the JSC. Good morning, Sam. I think you're going to take us through and lead us through the panel discussion. Good morning. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Leon. Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you for spending time with us um, as we talk about 
the opportunities that we find uh, in the South African capital markets, um, specifically through our inward listing uh, framework. I'm going to ask uh, the panelists to put, please uh, put their cameras on. Um, Richard Stout is the head of um, equities and uh, capital markets at Standard Bank. Uh, Richard, welcome. Um, Will Ridge is at Investec Corporate and Institutional Banking, and he is the head of equities there. And uh, Patricia Kula Festa is uh, in the primary markets team at uh, the JSE and responsible for the origination of uh new listings and i must say she's actually the uh the, the the real kind of hero behind this event uh putting everything together so thank you um for all of that uh patricia um maybe uh richard we can start with you just um you know in terms of your space as an advisor um and 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 having uh, concluded uh, some of these uh, inward listings um anything that you can tell us about the process uh how it's worked for you and your clients um and and and, and really just uh your, your 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 encouragement for the audience this morning yeah, thanks sam and, and and good morning everybody um yeah look, i i think as as we just heard through through the video clip um you know the 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 process really is 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 very straightforward and and very streamlined um you know i think with the fast track listing now you can list within 21 days you know that is a pretty phenomenal achievement when you think about it mm. um and you know the the, the the process really is one whereby the JSC is comfortable uh, if the company is already listed on a recognised international exchange, which would include the likes of a London stock exchange. The JSC is comfortable to place reliance upon, I guess, the disclosure and reporting regime of that market, and that's really what allows uh, these listings to proceed, you know, on, on a very short time fuse, uh, and generally with, with, with relatively little difficulty. Um, so, so, you know, we, we've done it for a number of clients at Standard Bank um, and, and it really does work very well. Um, and, and, and obviously then as we'll come on to talk about, no doubt, you know, that, that then gives corporates the ability to access a really attractive deep and broad pool of, of, of liquidity within the South African market. Great, thank you. Thanks, thanks, Richard. Um, Will, you, you you chat to investors as well. Um, you know, what is the attraction for South African investors? Um, and, and as Valdine spoke about, you know, our, our capital markets are quite deep and, and our investor base is, is, is broad. But Will, maybe just tell us about, from an investor perspective, why this inward listing um, kind of framework is, is is quite useful for them, and um, and 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 why it's uh, proven so popular. Yeah, I mean, maybe just to, to sort of take a step back and sort of set the scene, and I think uh, maybe just provide uh, some color on on what I really see as the crux of this opportunity, right? So for for everyone on this call, there's a piece of regulation in South Africa called Reg 28, which prescribes how much money a pension fund is allowed offshore, right? And, and, and that prescribes that 70% of pension fund assets need to remain in SA. Okay? And to the serious uh, CEO's comments earlier, that means that number one, not only is every deep pool of capital in South Africa, right? So relative to other emerging markets, our, our domestic sa savings framework and network is much more developed, much deeper, but it also means this capital is tracked, right? I mean, and on very, very conservative assumptions. I mean, you're looking at something like, you know, $500 billion dollars in, this, in savings that, that cannot leave South Africa, right? And, and to that point, domestic managers are trying to manage this RAND risk, which is very real. I mean, the currency is depreciated, let's just call it uh, single mid digits forever. Um, and they are very, very engaged in providing a hedge to pensioners uh, to offset that, right? And so I think, I think that is a very, very important thing to understand, right? Um, the second thing here is I think you know, I, I would encourage people to get down here. And again, the, the serious CEO's uh, uh, comments were interesting, but you know, it is a, um, the, the, the quality of the asset managers down here, I think would surprise a lot of people for the right reasons, right? So over a period of time, um, we have in-housed the management of that offshore portion of your portfolios. You know, so rather than someone like a T. Rose showed as BlackRock managing that over time, 
These investors manage it now. Um, and again, given the composition of our market, they've built out their expertise uh, across a number of big global sectors. I mean, to understand the JSC, you have to understand, you know, global tech, global miners, global luxury, global beverages. You know, I'm just talking to stocks like Process, Richmond, ABM, British American Tobacco, et cetera. So that global knowledge base really is there. And there's a very deep understanding of the other sort of uh, business models that, um, that, that, that link into, uh, you know, the local benchmarks, et cetera. But hopefully that frames um, a bit of opportunity set and the extent to which, you know, people have had real success in terms of getting better rating because there's just a finite uh, choice of stocks down in South Africa with a very big track pool of capital. I'll leave it there. No, great. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks, Will. Um, you, you mentioned some sectors. Um, you, you know, when you're on the phone to your uh, institutional investor clients, what are some of the, 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 the sectors that um, the clients are saying, shucks, you know, we've got a broad space and a, and a broad uh, market in South Africa, but, but there are some industries that are, are, are lacking. And I suppose some geographies that are lacking um, on our exchange as well. So, so just a view on, on, on what kind of, if, if folks could wave a magic wand, you know, what, what, what else they'd like to see um, on the exchange from a sector and maybe from a geographic exposure perspective? Sure, so um, framing the geographic, uh, it's actually a problem, is, is really interesting, right? So um, South Africa is obviously a very cyclical economy in itself, right? But again, given how our market's developed, miners were obviously, um, at, at the forefront of that development, right? So the likes of BHP, Anglo have always played a big role in our market, as are the big sort of precious metals miners that are essentially global companies now, right? Um, but you then have the likes of uh, NASPA's huge success with Tencent in China, um, Richmond, obviously, with a massive China focus, AB InBev with a massive Chinese business. I mean, you're starting to get the theme here, right? Just the composition of our index has emerged into a very cyclical and fairly one-way China bet. My investors are desperate for some, div some diversification uh, and largely defensive diversification. They feel quite exposed. Um, I, I would say, and, and, and we've seen it. I mean, Richard, you know, there, there's been some other processes we worked on, um, you know, recently where you're seeing uh, big FMCG companies, you know, look towards the JSC. And that's where I see real opportunity, right? I think if it's more defensive, consumer oriented, and again, something to diversify what I perceive to be some pretty outsized China risk at the moment, at the same point in time as the risks to that market are, are more elevated than, than they've been for a very long time. I'm telling you, if you can solve that problem for domestic portfolio managers, you're going to see a tangible change in rating. And you will start to see this SA market, you know, going to that serious score. You'll start to see the price getting made in South Africa, because that solves a real problem for domestic managers in terms of portfolio construction. No, oh, brilliant. Thanks, 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 Will. I think I think um, I think the China story is an interesting one. Um, we'll have to see how that unfolds. Certainly, this year has been one of volatility in that space, and so um, completely understand your, your your views where they're coming from from a from a from a risk perspective and and a defensive risk perspective um, as as well. Um, maybe Richard, back to you in terms of just. Um, you know, um, the, the, the CEO of Sirius mentioned around uh, fungibility of uh, the shares, um, trading the shares across the two registers, uh, in his case, obviously the UK um, and the South African register. Do you want to just maybe unpack that a little bit more in terms of what you've seen from a client perspective? And maybe one of the things that you can do is then link that into index inclusion, which, which has obviously been quite an important um, key success factor for our dual uh, listed counters in that, you know, again, to, to, to go back to serious, that inclusion in the South African property index has helped uh, serious gain traction uh, from, from investors. So maybe you want to just tell us about those, how those two link the register, the fungibility of the assets, plus then the uh, the index. Yeah, sure. So I guess very simply put on the fungibility point, um, you know, the, the, the JSC has essentially established very efficient links with a number of international exchanges um, that allow for 
the fungibility of shares across those those exchanges. So, you know, it obviously started back in in the early 2000s, late 1990s, with the likes of Anglo American SAB Miller at the time of Mutual setting up dual primary listings and essentially kind of creating a system whereby you could buy a share on one exchange and then move it across to the, the, the other exchanges register. And, and, and that's important in the sense that it does mean that the, 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 the kind of risk of segregating distinct pools of liquidity is somewhat mitigated. There is therefore fluidity across the two exchanges and investors can benefit from the liquidity across the whole market, just not just the, the exchange on which they would naturally trade. Um, it's also important in the sense that it does create an efficient market as well. So, um, you know, the, the arbitrage opportunity that perhaps you see in other markets where dual listings exist, where that fungibility doesn't exist, you can find that, you know, the, the share price on one exchange is materially different to the, the, the price on the other in, in, the, in, in the kind of equivalent currency. That's important for issuers. You know, issuers don't want to find themselves in a situation where they have that, that, that big arbitrage because it, it creates inefficiencies when it comes to them raising capital. So, um, so, so the JSE is, is very much a global exchange plugged into these other exchanges. And, and obviously, as I said, it started with London, but we've done, uh, you know, we've helped corporates list on exchanges like Frankfurt, uh, on Euronext, uh, Brussels, and, and essentially wherever you, wherever you go, um, you know, our view is you can trust that you can put in place if one system doesn't already exist, a very efficient fungibility mechanism. And coming to your second point about indexation inclusion, this, this is quite an important and, and valuable point to, to raise. So often in, in capital markets globally, companies will only really be eligible for indexation on the exchange where they have their primary listing. Um, the JSC is, is slightly different. The JSC essentially says, if you have a minimum portion of your register, of, of your total shares and issues sitting on our register, then you will qualify uh, for indexation inclusion through the JSC uh, index series. Um, that, that minimum threshold is undemanding. It's essentially 1%, uh, and I think there's a rounding. So really, all you need is half a percent of your issue chair capital sitting on the JSC. And that allows you to, to gain indexation inclusion. Now, obviously, if you stay at that level, the index weighting is driven by the volume held on the JSC, not the, 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 the kind of total market cap. But nevertheless, it's important. It, it allows you to get a foothold, and it means that you have relevance to investors in the South African market. You, you are on the index, and so many investors uh, are therefore forced to at least pay attention to you. As, as a listed company. So, you know, very different to other markets where you can list on their exchange, but because you don't get indexation inclusion, you're at some risk of becoming a bit of an orphan stock. No one really knows much about you. No one really has to care too much about you because you're not part of the benchmark. So I guess for anyone thinking about, you know, coming down uh, to Joe Bergen listing, I think aside from the ease of listing, aside from the deep pool of capital that we've talked about, reality is you, you can know for certain that you will be relevant as well. Brilliant. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Richard. I'm, I'm glad you, you, you mentioned that uh, wh while you can get into the game at half a percent, uh, it's not good to stay there, right? Because you actually, no, no, <laughs> actually want to be a, a significant part of that index. Um, and so that is something that, that we as a JSE work with issuers and, and, and of course advisors like yourselves to just guide them through that process of, of, of um, um, getting as much of that register on the uh, on the South African side as possible. Um, and um, maybe to then move to you, Patricia. Um, so, 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 so now that uh, Will, myself and, and Richard have, have, have done somewhat of a job of uh, and convincing people that that listing on um, the exchange via an inward listing is, is, is a great way to raise capital. And maybe we'll come back to to Richard and Will specifically around once you listed, how has it been to, to raise capital on, on, on the JSE? But Patricia, maybe you can talk us through um, the actual uh, criteria for listing on, on, on the exchange uh, in an inward listing framework. Sure, Sam. 
Um, so I think the point has been well iterated, the fact that the JSC has been working um, quite a lot in tweaking and catering our listing requirements for a smooth and efficient listing process. Um, and that's why we have bought these innovative ways of accessing the market, fast track listings, standard listings. And I think also the point that I wanted to make there is from a standard listing perspective, um, the nuance across the JSC and LSE in particular is that standard listed issuers don't get index eligibility. Um, however, if those standard listed companies inward list on the JSC, they are eligible for index inclusion if they meet the free float and net market cap and all those other requirements um, for, the, for the index itself. So maybe Sam, just to kind of touch on your points, um, I mean, ways of accessing and what the requirements are um, of accessing the capital markets is, you know, I want to touch on direct listings. That's a way of listing without necessarily raising capital. We refer to it by listing by way of introduction. Main rationale there again is liquidity, arbitrage, indexation and profile. Um, and I think again, the indexation, particularly for standard listed issuers, you know, if you list on the JSC is a significant, um, value add. So over the past decade, we have, um, or even more than a decade, we have listed over 100 companies by way of um, direct listings or way of introductions. Then, of course, you've got the normal um, equity listing slash IPO. So that's really where our secondary listing framework kicks in. You raise capital, you float in the market. And I think, you know, the important thing is that, you know, whilst we understand that London in particular is a, is a hive of activity at the moment in terms of capital raisings. You know, the important thing is, it, uh, to note is that, you know, our investors are looking for additional exposure. So as these companies are trotting the globe to raise capital and perhaps are not able to place all their shares and raise the capital that they're looking at raising is that they do consider the JSC. We've got a streamlined, efficient way of accessing the market. Come and speak to our local asset managers. And you'll probably find, um, if it's of course, it's a, if it's a good company, that you'll probably be quite well subscribed from the South African investor perspective. So just, um, and then of course, maybe one point to to also mentioned is um, another way of accessing the market is depository receipts, very similar to GDRs. We've got the sponsored and unsponsored. Um, unfortunately, it doesn't fit into the um, Reg 28 classification that uh, Will was speaking about. So these instruments are currently still considered as foreign instruments, but this may change at a point in time. And of course, that's also an easier way of accessing the market um, in South Africa. So what are the requirements? I mean, just as a very high level in terms of our secondary listing framework, um, we have um, 10 with one additional one that has recently been added, 11 exchanges that we um, accredited, uh, accredited for secondary listing um, uh, uh, framework. So really what those exchanges are is the Australian Stock Exchange, the New York NASDAQ, Euronext, Brussels, uh, Luxembourg, um, the LSE, of course. Um, and there we look at the premium, we look at the standard and we look at the AIM, TSX, uh, Euronext, Amsterdam, Frankfurt, and the Swiss exchange. And recently, um, of course, we've been looking at the, at the Singapore exchange. So um, these exchange or these um, accredited exchanges qualify you for a secondary listing, which means that you access the market, you issue a pre-listing and a prospectus into our market. And of course you raise the capital. Um, our turnaround times in terms of appro approval processes are relatively quick. We've got a 10 day turnaround time from informal to formal and to the extent that all the information is at hand, you can probably execute a listing as what we heard in the in the interview relatively quickly. In fact, the fast track listing process has probably been the most expedited way of of listing and raising capital. Um, and there, what the requirements are is that if you have an issuer or a company that's been listed on either New York, London, Australia, or Toronto for longer than 18 months, you can access the market with a pre-listing announcement. So no need for a prospectus, it's a pre-listing announcement. And really our main rationale and thinking around this is to say, let's create an expedited way without the necessarily regulatory um, and administrative burdens. So what we would look at is we would incorporate information by reference. Whatever is disclosed on the home exchange, you would then um, disclose that into the pre-listing announcement. So it's a very streamlined, effective way of listing. And AB InBev, in fact, was the one that listed in 21 days. The other requirements that we look at is we look at spread. 
and again, those shareholders or that share capital can be spread around um, across both the local and the offshore register. Really what that means is that you might have to put in a script lending agreement in place. Um, and then also what our issuer regulation colleagues would look like is the um, MOI, particularly if the company is incorporated outside the borders of South Africa, just a broad review around um, those aspects that are included in those MOI, and just to make sure that if there's anything that needs to be aligned. But I think in practice, um, particularly from the LSE, we've got 19 odd issuers that are cross-listed across our exchanges. That's a well-established process. So uh, there would be very little uh, nuances that would, that would pop out of that. Um, and then of course, any disclosure um, documents um, that they would uh, review. Corporate governance is important, is that again, where the company is incorporated, wherever the, uh, whatever the corporate governance code that is applicable to that, to, to that issuer, um, that would also apply um, in the South African context with, with perhaps, again, some nuances if there's some requirement for any alignment. And the important thing is that I've, I know that speaking to a number of issuers, um, you know, there perhaps is some concern around the script lending agreement where you would usually typically put that in place, placing some direct to shareholders into the script lending agreement. We're looking, we look at about a 5%. Uh, um, and also what that means is that, um, you know, we want to make sure that the shares can be traded and settled quite easily, but that is released within a six to 12 month period. So it's a it's an interim step that you put in place just to ensure clearing and settlement takes place. Um, so really that's Sam in terms of the admission criteria and maybe what I can touch on is just the ongoing obligations. And again, you know, I think from an exchange perspective, understanding um, that a number of global issuers are looking at consolidating their regulatory uh, 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 jurisdictions in terms of disclosure, our inward listing framework is very flexible to say that if we have a company that's dual listed on the, on the exchange, um, there is a primary regulator and we typically take the lead in terms of that primary regulator and um, the obligations on that issuer. Um, where there might be certain nuances in terms of corporate actions, timetables, for example, we may just have to align. But again, given the fact that we've got such a, a, a long and standing relationship with London in particular, there shouldn't be any issues around alignment of timetables. So really on an ongoing basis, it is very flexible, easy to comply. Whatever you disclose in your home markets, you would disclose in the, in the, in the South African markets. No, excellent. Thanks. Thanks, Patricia. And I think for me, the, the, the value proposition is to say um, you, you, you have a good listing in, in, in London, but here's another venue that can help you diversify both the type of investor. And I think that um, the series CEO mentioned that not it's not just about the geographic and the number of investors but there is a different mindset and so that's that sometimes can give you good insights into into growing business but also an ability to to sell value to different types of investors who are looking at a particular company in in different ways um patricia one of the things that that he also mentioned was uh, how cost effective we are. Do you want to touch on that? Yes, of course. And you know, I smile when I when I when I say this and kind of look at it because I was doing the conversions into uh, pounds. And um, well, let me take you through it. So when you list on the JSC, the JSC costs you would uh, pay a documentation fee, which is the review of the prospectus, the pre-listing statement. Um, they're converted into pounds. You're looking at 5,200 odd pounds. I mean, again, this is, this is really marginal and, 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 and really cost effective. So on listing, you pay a documentation fee plus an initial listing fee. And the initial listing fee is based on the monetary value of the shares that you'll be placing. Um, so if you look at just broadly a market cap, a, a company with a market capitalization of 500,000 Rand, um, <laughs> again, you're looking at a JSE fee in terms of the minimum threshold of, of 89 pounds and a maximum of 185,000. Um, and that's for a company with a market capitalization of 50 billion Rand in terms of market cap. So again, you can see that from an initial listing perspective, really cost effective. Um, 
And um, really, I mean, those figures uh, just kind of put it into perspective. This does exclude third party advisory costs, but also, you know, the ongoing cost of compliance and the ongoing cost of listing is also a consideration. And from an ongoing annual listing fee perspective, so the year that you uh, list, the following year, then you'll be listing, uh, uh, build an annual listing fee. That's based on a market cap, uh, on an average market capitalization for the previous year. Um, and just looking at those bands at a minimum, you're looking at £2,700 and a maximum of £24,000. And yet, I want to say there's, there's, there's more room for discounts. So we still apply a 30% discount on that for, inward, for any inward listed stocks. So again, really cost effective. Um, and may I also stress, this does exclude the third party advisory costs. Um, but, but really, from a, from a JSC perspective, um, I mean, I think those figures just speak for themselves, Sam. Thanks, thanks, Patricia, agreed. Um, just a reminder to all our attendees, uh, if you do have questions, um, please uh, throw them in the chat. Um, we will be having a, a Q&A session a little bit later. Um, maybe back to, to you, Will. Um, can you talk us through just, you know, once a company is listed, the opportunities for capital raise um, within the South African uh, uh, context. You know, one of the statistics that's really um, impressed me was in, in 2020, the um, amount of capital raised on the exchange as secondary capital. So these are existing companies uh, doing kind of share placements, um, rights issues, etc., cetera, um, doubled uh, from 2019 to, to 2020. I think we hit about um, close to 70 billion Rand. And, and that really spoke to me about the, the, the benefits of being a high quality listed company that in the event of a crisis like we had last year in terms of COVID and that we're still working through, that companies could quickly come to the market and, um, and raise capital to shore up balance sheets, to, to make sure that they can uh, be resilient through the crisis and, and to also take advantage of, of, of some of the market movements that we had. So, so maybe Will, you can just um, talk us through a little bit about your experiences um, from a capital raise perspective and, 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 and any advice that, that you can give somebody uh, who's already listed looking to do so. Yeah, so I mean, I, I, I don't think I had much value on the advice piece. I mean, maybe, you know, Richard uh, talks more, more of the corporates there. Let me just talk sure. to the investor piece. I mean, um, mm. you know, AA, we've been fortunate. We've had a very sort of dominant share in, in placements uh, this year. So we've participated and seen a lot of that. Um, they haven't actually been that defensive, to be completely honest. You know, there's been a lot of sort of corporate restructuring or guys actually looking for uh, growth opportunities. The one thing I would highlight, though, is that um, your average discounts have compressed quite markedly, right? Um, you know, uh, I mean, uh, Richard will, will know. I mean, we do this stuff all the time. Um, you know, you used to see sort of 10% discounts when people were placing sort of, you know, a couple of billion rand. That is squeezed a lot. I mean, it's, it's very competitive in terms of uh, these book builds now, both in terms of the big domestic institutions that see them as a real liquidity opportunity, right? So, um, you know, we had a, a big disc placement founder selling recently, a big cornerstone investor use that as a real opportunity, uh, liquidity event, an opportunity to get a slug that would take them months to get in the market and was willing to, you know, pay quite a tight discount for that privilege, right? So, I mean, that's, that's very much the, um, the sort of one side of the equation. And again, just to give everyone a sense of the developed nature of these markets, I mean, you would see every single big global hedge fund that runs a placement pr process would be in our book builds almost every time. Assuming the liquidity profile is there, these guys are there as well, right? Um, and again, just for ev everyone on the call, you know, that is all your big brand name global funds. And again, they with this big, big domestic pool of trap capital have meant that these discounts have been, um, have been much tighter than I've seen for, uh, for a long time. In terms of the corporate experience, I think, I think, I think Richard, you're going to be probably better placed to, uh, to deal with that. Yeah. Thanks, thanks, Will. Um, Richard, over to you. Your your experience on the the, the capital raises um, from your side. I think um, maybe just to build on, on on what Will covered. I mean, you know, b b before I moved down to South Africa, you know, ten years or so ago, I kind of covered Africa alongside the Middle East, 
and, and Eastern Europe. And, and I have to say, you know, the South African market has, has always been the market in which it's e easier uh, to, to raise capital. And again, we've talked about the dynamics about this kind of large deep pool of trapped liquidity. You know, that, 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 makes, that makes it very easy for companies, whether it's domestic South African companies or inwardly listed companies to, to, to raise capital. Um, but it's not just about the ease of raising capital. You know, it is also about the quality of institutions that you can access if you do put a, in place a listing on the JSE. And I remember, I remember at the listing event uh, for, for Glencore in 2013, that was a company that, that, that I helped list on the JSE. You know, the CEO at the time, Ivan Glazenberg, you know, said that, you know, and, 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 and let's be honest, Glencore is a big global company. He, he stood up in front of, you know, everybody and said, he was blown away by the quality of engagement that he had with, uh, South African based investors as he'd been marketing the listing you know and this is a CEO who you know speaks to investors across all parts of the world um, and, and he said that the quality of engagement the quality of understanding uh, and ultimately therefore the, the quality of, of, of support he could rely upon from the South African investor base was really important to him and something that he, he he had acknowledged and and, and and known about but 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 had, hadn't fully appreciated that he'd actually come down to south africa and spent time with these investors and i think that the final point i'd make and sam you touched upon it um earlier is you know what, what why why is this relevant why why is it helpful to have access to this incre incremental pool of capital it's it's simply because it's been proven that the more diverse your shareholder register the less volatile your stock is and certainly as you heard from the ceo of sirius um, the more access to capital you do have through your listing structure, uh, the better chance you have of your stock, uh, you know, tra trading, trading well and re-rating. Um, and, and that's just in the normal course of events. But obviously, if we come back to kind of the ease of raising capital, it does also mean that your ability to raise capital, the execution risk around those types of transactions, you know, I think is severely reduced if you have the ability to tap not just your existing, pre-existing kind of investor base off your primary listing, but, but having the ability to access uh, the South African institutional market as well. No, excellent, excellent. Thanks, thanks, Richard. So I think um, at this stage, we're gonna go uh, round the table for some kind of closing thoughts from from, from panelists. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll start with you, Patricia, and then, uh, to Will and, and to Richard. And then I will then um, uh, talk about an exciting project that, that we as the JSE are um, embarked on, which is to say that alongside our public market, we are looking to develop um, a solution in, in, in the private market um, that, that, that's really uh, very exciting at this stage. But why don't we have some uh, closing thoughts uh, from you, Patricia, and then, and then we'll go on to Will and then Richard. Thanks, Sam. So um, I think just from my perspective, and again, on behalf of the JSC, just thank you very much for the British Chamber to putting this forum together. Um, hopefully in this forum, we have managed to illustrate the ease um, and the appetites for these uh, dual listed companies. And um, of course, you know, if you are an advisor, if you are a company considering accessing um, the local or the South African um, capital markets, please engage with us. Um, you know, uh, 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 Will and Richard have both alluded to the fact that our investors are looking for more Rand Hedge um, uh, exposure. And I think that's really where these dual listings do play. So, um, yeah, I think from, from, from a JSC perspective, you know, we have, we have driven the point quite hard to say easy, flexible, fast and efficient way of accessing the markets and, 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 and please engage with us. Thanks, Patricia. Will? Yeah, I mean, I just, I mean, for, for um, you know, offshore corporates, I mean, I just see it as a very, a very cheap optionality. I mean, Patricia, you frame the costs, it's not going to move the needle in, in anyone's life. Uh, and I'm just saying, you know, that provides you access to, as I said, one, a very big and two, very trapped pool of capital and be an investor base that is often willing to pay a premium to solve for that problem, right? To the benefit of hopefully corporates that you advise. I think it is pretty much as simple as that. Um, yeah, I'll leave it there. And uh, over to you, Richard, for your final comments. 
I'm really not sure there's much more to add. I think you know, I think I think Patricia and Will have some some summarised it well. It's 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 the cost benefit analysis. Um, I guess we've we've covered a lot of ground on this discussion. Uh, there's perhaps been quite a bit to take in, but 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 that's how I you know, distill it all down. You know, the cost benefit analysis, in my view, stacks up very well. Um, but obviously, very keen and and very uh, willing to to spend time with people. You know, post this this discussion if they do want to learn more and go through it in 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 a slightly slower pace. Fantastic, thank you, thank you so much uh, to our panelists. Uh, really engaging conversation about uh, the benefits of of an inward listing uh, onto the JSE. I am going to um, shift gears a little bit and 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 uh, uh, tell you about this um, this new opportunity that we we we're looking at. Um, called uh, JSE private placements, um, which is really a, a response and, 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 and a move to answer the need that we've seen uh, in our market for, for, for clients saying, yes, there's a listed market, but there's a lot of activity happening in the unlisted market, in the private equity space, in the venture capital space, uh, in the private debt space. Um, what is the JSE doing about about um, that that space? Um, and so, just in terms of just uh, some background, you know, if you look at where private equity has been in the South African context, we are starting to see um, continual growth in, in in assets under management in AUM um, within the South African space, uh, both in the uh, private equity side on, on, on the left hand side of my screen and then the venture capital side in terms of the the right hand side of my screen and um, what we're looking at is that you know from a kgar perspective the private equity space has been growing at a kgar of about uh, 9.2 uh, percent since uh, 1999 um, and we've seen that investors uh, have been coming in and out of uh, investments in the private equity space quite strongly in in South Africa. Um, I think if you look at venture capital certainly uh, venture capital is a nascent space in in South Africa but nonetheless growing and uh, what is interesting for me just to look at the, the type of investors uh, we, we're looking at, you know, independent funds uh, leading the pack. Um, interesting to see government really uh, pushing this uh, specific sector, both the venture capital and the uh, private equity side from, from, a, from a pension fund perspective into an asset management space. Uh, a lot of government support for private equity and venture capital funds. And we see government uh, coming in second in terms of the investor type there. Um, some corporates also uh, jumping on the bandwagon, um, but also a, 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 a nascent but growing um, pool of angel investors um, sitting in that uh, venture capital space. Um, the, the story is not just a South African one. If we look at um, Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, we, we're looking at, um, uh, at, a, at a huge opportunity, but a growing opportunity. And I think we, as a JSC, when we look at this, we see that less than 1% of pension assets are invested across the continent uh, in pension funds. And so we see much, much room to grow there, uh, whereas uh, the global average is about 28%. Uh, 26% in, um, in, in, in in private equity funds. And that's been growing since the global financial crisis uh, from, from sort of 19% of AUM being in, 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 the, uh, uh, in, in the private equity space. Um, development finance institutions are quite dominant uh, across the continent, um, in East Africa, for example, um, limited partners uh, are made up 70% are, um, are, are DFIs. And then um, um, uh, private equity 
um, does still exhibit some challenges across the continent uh, due to uh, low data and information. Uh, benchmarks are limited, diversification uh, is required, and portfolio allocation, as we mentioned, only 1% uh, of that. So obviously 2020 um, was a challenging year for the entire market. Um, and but but we've seen a rebound. Uh, we we've seen growth until 2019, and 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 starting to see some rebound in in 2021. Um, from a global perspective, again, um, you know we're seeing good growth across across a global AUM in the private market space. And private equity is the leader there. Uh, real estate was a hard hit by the pandemic and um but but private debt actually did quite well in uh 2020 uh whereas uh infrastructure and natural resources um were were, were a bit of a challenge so in response to this growing uh, private markets environment that we see across the world um various uh, global exchanges have then introduced private uh, market spaces. Um, NASDAQ has NASDAQ private markets. Um, they've recently put it as a standalone uh, business and, and invited the sell side bankers to uh, participate with them. Um, they've done over sort of $30 billion in total volume um, and completed a whole host of new uh, deals. In Europe, the LSE's uh, elite program has has funded 120 companies in excess of a billion pounds raised uh, since 2012. Um, we're also seeing that uh, Internext from Euronext has really um, uh, invited many, many SMEs onto their platform to raise capital um, and uh, over 3 billion euros uh, in that space. Um, and so really from a JSE perspective, we're saying, um, JPP, JSE Private Placements, um, is looking to enter the market uh, quite shortly. We are uh, on the edge of our seat uh, waiting for a, a license approval from, from the FSCA um, as, a, as an FSP, a uh, financial services uh, provider, which, which we understand is, 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 is uh, due any moment now. But really, our value proposition is that we're saying we are a, a, a technology-enabled platform for private market capital raise um, and issuance uh, through digitized uh, security. And really, we're looking to provide cost-effective, centralized, and more transparent capital raising opportunities for both issuers and investors across private equity and private debt. Some of these benefits, uh, we're creating a marketplace, bringing um, investors and issuers in a space to find each other um, easier customizable applications, um, immediate digital issuance of security, uh, reduced costs and timelines, a centralized platform allowing this marketplace to evolve as various parts of the marketplace find each other. Um, syndication is important, much easier in the public markets, and so we're looking to to, to help make it more efficient in, in, the, in the private markets as well. Um, and, and really, uh, over time, uh, looking to manage uh, shareholder registers in the private space um, and, and as well as um, create a database of information. So where are we? We have a website that's not yet live. So uh, you are privileged to be seeing kind of a a, a sneak preview at, at, as, at of the website, um, powered by our partners in the UK called Globacap, as you can see at the bottom of your screen. But really, this is a place for people to, SMEs and infrastructure project owners to come and raise capital, um, and a place for investors to come and invest in, 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 in the private uh, markets. Um, the investor portal, so if you're an investor looking to invest in uh, companies, the investor portal allows you to then see summaries of these transactions. Um, you can sign NDAs on the platform. You can go into a secure data room 
and 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 then starts to engage with the material online and of course um, a facility to engage offline as well um, chat functionality meeting requests that you can arrange um, management presentations and site visits etc um, and then our management portal really gives you a sense of how your transaction is, is performing, who's looked at your transaction um, as you're looking to raise the capital, um, how, where your investors are coming from. This is a really good tool as well for advisors. So advisors who are um, advising uh, private companies to raise capital can have this dashboard view of how the capital raise is, is, is progressing. Um, and, and, and the system also allows for, 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 for book build that says, well, maybe the company has a different valuation to what I see as, as an investor. And so I can then um, uh, counteract with a, with a different valuation. And so the management portal allows for issuers and the advisors to have a view into how investors are progressing through the transactions. So that's really a, a whistle-stop view of um, JSE private placements. And so um, really the context here is that as um, advisors on this platform, as companies uh, in the UK considering uh, capital raising in the South African market, we've been telling you about our listed market which is an easy, efficient, quick way to raise capital. But perhaps the company is still at an early stage, SME um, part of your evolution. And so we're saying uh, from, a, um, from a JSE perspective, here's another platform coming up um, uh, fairly soon um, that can then allow investors and issuers in the uh, UK space to access the South African capital markets um, looking for opportunities to invest in as well as uh, looking for capital uh, to raise in the South African space. Um, and that's it for me. Thanks. Thanks, uh, Leon. No, th thank you, Sam. <clears throat> and thanks to the panel, indeed, the JSC for sponsoring this, this great event. Some, some real cool market insights there. And it's interesting that our membership here in South Africa across the region and in the UK is predominantly made up of SMEs looking to expand and grow into the region. So hopefully we can uh, connect you with many aspirant listees. Uh, I'm going to hand over to my vice president and colleague, Cecilia Albertain, who has some questions from the audience. Cecilia. Yes, good morning, everyone. Um, good to see you all here. And thank you to the JSE also. It's been a a good member of our chamber for many years um, and really a great example of what has been achieved in South Africa. I was actually quite interested to read a bit more about the JSE's history um, just for this webinar um, and quite impressed to discover the JSE is 134 years old this year. So it, it just proves that it's a really stable and great investment place. And today we've heard so much about new innovations and new products and also how you've made it easier for businesses to list already. We've had some questions around people interested in dual listings with the UK, the LSE as well as um, the JSE. And I think you've really spoken through all of that, um, all our panelists in great detail today. I think another question that's, that's on everybody's minds and lips these days is around the New Companies Act's proposals of additional regulations companies, particularly versus privately owned companies. Um, I know it's been welcomed in some quarters and um, in other quarters, though, it's been saying it makes it even more onerous. So I'm interested to hear also from our members who've asked this question, if I can hear from the panel, what are your views on these new regulations? And do you think there are some positives from it? And if it does make things more onerous, um, how would that be handled? If I can ask all of the panelists to just comment where you can, please. Actually, maybe, 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 yeah, maybe, maybe I'll start. I mean, and I'm not gonna go into the detail. I think it's, it's, it's kind of more a, a point of principle perhaps that, that I'll make. Um, and that is obviously, you know, th there is, 
There is a decision that companies make when listing, which is that they are moving into a regulated environment wherever they choose to list. And obviously part of that, you know, does extend to the governance framework uh, that they opt into uh, by virtue of moving into an environment where they're uh, inviting minority shareholders into the business. Um, you know, for some companies, you know, that is, you know, a step that they're reluctant to take. Um, for others, they actually see it as a positive because it provides structure around the business. Uh, and in some ways, being listed almost acts as an external, uh, I guess, endorsement of, you know, the, the, the quality of governance that, they, that they've built into the business. Um, again, if, 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 if we bring this back to the topic that we're discussing today, which is, you know, the inward listing of existing listed companies on other exchanges, in this case, I guess, London, um, you know, I'd come back to the point that we made earlier, which is that by and large, the JSC will uh, rely upon the governance framework and governance requirements that uh, the company is obliged to adhere to through its primary listing venue. Um, and so, therefore, you know, I wouldn't necessarily expect, you know, in the context of an inward listing on the JSC, I wouldn't expect that, you know, there would be any material shift in what is already uh, being required of, of, of the company. Thanks for that, Richard. Thank you. Anyone else have anything else to add on that point? I think Richard covered it quite well. So, so thank you for that. Um, and, you know, again, I think to the extent that it uh, impacts any, um, you know, South African based company, the JSC has provided commentary and, um, you know, I believe that the process itself um, is perhaps not finalized as yet. So, um, but I think for, for us as the exchanges that we need to consider all of these potential changes. Um, and I think just to also highlight, you know, what Richard said is that when you are accessing the public markets, we spoke about the large pension funds that invest um, onto the exchange. And I think it's important that there's a, a, a good balance between the right level of regulation to ensure that there's, you know, credibility um, and, and uh, kind of lessen any volatility in our market. So, um, you know, I think from a JSC perspective, you know, that process is ongoing. So, but we are, of course, always looking at the balance between issuers and investors. Samuel, would you like to add anything to that? No, all good, nothing, nothing more, thank right. you. Okay, I think we've really covered most of our questions in um, the really thorough presentations and the case study specifically also. So thank you to everyone for that. I've also got Sharon Constance on, on the line. He is the head of the SA Chamber of Commerce in London. Um, and Sharon, if you want to say maybe a few closing words as well from your side, um, we're happy to, to put you on. I'm just going to try it. There we go. Right, Sharon, I've put you on and promoted you to panelists if you want to put your camera on as well. It looks, there we go, marvelous. There yes, yes. <laughs> lots of buttons to press. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Leon and Cecilia. It's wonderful to see you. Sam, I thoroughly enjoyed your presentation and listening to those from everyone else and also to Steve our being ready uh, present as well. I'm chairman of the South African Chamber of Commerce. Uh, we call ourselves sister brother chambers with the British Chamber of Business and do as many things as we can together because it's two sides of the same coin a lot of the time, not necessarily all the time. Um, the guys in South Africa have got a very strong offering uh, in the strategic planning side as well, which is fantastic. Um, what I find, what some of my comments I would like to make is, it was really welcoming um, Sam and Patricia just to see how um, innovation, uh, can-do mentality, uh, technology advancement is being used and it, I see this as two major benefits that you are offering. One is the SME can now get to the market 
which is something that obviously is always a problem because the markets are not necessarily as easily accessible for smaller companies. But the other part I found really, really um, warming, particularly given current times of COP26, is that we are enabling engagement without our dual listed companies having to do that long haul flight. Of course, they're going for tourism, but from a business perspective, the innovation that the JSE has brought forward is really totally in line with global um, objectives of lowering carbon and yet engaging in another way, which I find also quite rewarding is equal opportunity for all investors and for all companies through a platform. Because so often when you don't have something as rigorous as that, is it's not equal to all, which is obviously one of the requirements of our Companies Act in the UK, is that you treat all stakeholders equally. The other part that I, I encourage um, UK SMEs, uh, companies that want to go for dual listing, is South Africa has got a very strong culture of can-do. It's a very knowledgeable culture in the financial services sector, um, exchange sector. There's some very good, competent um, capabilities in the country. But not only that, it's that can-do mentality that uh, what is it you want, I'll tell you when I can get it done, rather than you come to many other exchanges and financial centers where it's that's a bit difficult. It, we don't have it just yet. And South Africa, uh, just listening for all of you, the, the part that I love about South Africans is we just get it done. And obviously this is going to help the South African economy, which from our point of view as a chamber is why we are here, is to uplift the lives of South Africans, which will happen through the uh, generating of business employment, things like that. Mm -hmm. So not only have we got a strong financial services sector, you have a very strong legal sector in South Africa, and you were alluding to the changes in the Companies Act, I'd like to allude to probably the, the leading corporate governance code in the world being Ping Po. And many other um, worlds are simplifying and changing their codes to the outcomes-based code that South Africa has led on. So there are many reasons why I think having a dual listing in South Africa is an extremely powerful offering. And Leon and Cecilia and the JSE, it's really lovely to see South Africa putting its first foot forward so strongly. Thank you to everyone who's attended, and thanks from the South African Chamber in the UK. Thank you, Sharon. And I think the JC will be keen to hear that we do collaborate regularly on events. And the last time we spoke was over dinner, in person, over dinner at the House of Lords, just before the lockdown. And we're looking to seeing you there early next year and flying the flag for the JSC in all of the UK regions, partnering with our chambers in Manchester, Birmingham, and, and, and beyond. I'd really like to thank Patricia, Sam, Richard, Val Dean uh, and Stacey and indeed my team, Cecilia and Ema for putting this together. Uh, again, what I've heard, it's a cost-effective, easy, yeah. flexible, fast and efficient mechanism to access the capital market. So please do reach out to us if we can connect with the JC. And we look very much forward to kind of continuing to help our members grow and to flying the flag for business in our region and beyond. Thank you all very much and have a great Friday and good weekend beyond. Thank you. <laughs>